I get to wear a suit for a rare occasion and I don't smell like elephant snot or um, a pangolin poo and then it goes back in the cupboard. There's only one of it for about six months again. So I'm quite excited to, to get the outing. So most of you are not wearing ties, but it's a big thing for me. So I, I'm never quite sure why I speak at an event like this because perhaps Greg's splurged the coffee budget on drinks for the office party and so I'm here to wake you up in the morning. But there are so many more erudite and clever people speaking um, but hopefully this is at least a bit entertaining to start with. So this is my day job and how I normally do things and um, I'm just a vet. It, it sounds much more fancy than what he's made and don't put those 3D glasses on. Half of it is just to make you look silly for the photos, by the way. <laughs> just like Back to the Future. So again, these are the kind of conditions that I often work in. It sounds very fancy, but there's usually very little resources, no money, crazy animals that are trying to kill me, throw poop at me, drown me, eat me, and that's just the children. So, um, <laughs> so and, and I, ha I do see my wife and I do like my kids, so I try and balance everything together. But hopefully there's some lessons, because I'm not just here for entertainment, there's some lessons that we can actually get from my weird way of working that may translate to something useful for human healthcare. So we, we know, I mean, when we do endodontics in a line, it's got to be pretty resilient. So if it works in a line, it's going to work in people. And we know that a chimpanzee that I fix a fracture on, if it goes running around and jumping out of trees, we, we can see if those clinical studies that are in a London hospital will actually stand up to what we need them to do in Papua New Guinea, which is very different to where the papers you know, are written. And there's still a lot of things that we don't understand. I mean, it would be great to know why and how hedgehogs hibernate and see if we could use that for Elon Musk's you know, space exploration or why it is that we're always told that we eat too much crappy food and we get no exercise and so we all die of heart disease, that gorillas eat a vegetable-based diet, get lots of exercise and they still have a huge problem with heart disease slightly different to us we haven't quite figured it out yet but i'm sure someone as clever as as tim over there who's brilliant with nutrition will tell me i'm an idiot and he solved it already so really what i'm here to talk to you about today is a different way of thinking really because if you're here at wired and there's you all know elon musk i went to school with him a couple of years have passed i don't remember him sadly and you wouldn't remember me and it's always a bit humbling when you sort of, you know, running around getting stopped by custom officials with a bunch of crappy baggage and trying to patch things together with a few pounds to think, hmm, maybe I could have done better. But anyway, that keeps it real. But that's not where we're working. So a lot of the talks today will be about fancy things and robotics and AI that will be what we call marginal gains. So there's a good business opportunity there because there's a huge profit margin, but you're only helping improve things slightly for a minority of the world's population. Whereas there are really easy gains and the profit margins may be tiny, but the scale makes them still good business opportunities and you don't want to really forget about them because there are millions and millions of people who need very little to dramatically improve their, their quality of life and the healthcare available to them. So that's really why I'm here just to give you a couple of ideas and show you the weird things we've come up with. So I spoke here a couple of years ago and Wired kindly ran a very crazy and overly flattery article on me and I, I showed my trick when I work in, in different places. I use these cheap reusable hand warmers to warm up the surgical telescope when I do keyhole surgery and it doesn't fog when I go and do an appendectomy in a, in a orangutan in Borneo and I can do my op instead of needing thousands of pounds of fancy electric stuff. And a year ago, someone came to me and said, look, they've stolen your idea and this company's manufactured it. And I thought, that's fantastic. That's the whole point, is that if we, can, if we can get these things out, simpler, cheaper ways of obviously doing things that can benefit people. So I was really just going to show a couple of crazy bits here just to make you think about the possibilities. And they come from the challenges I face, but they do have corollaries to human health care. So one are elephants. Now, it doesn't matter if you have a very expensive elephant in a zoo that is priceless or you have an aged elephant like this in Sri Lanka in, in one of the reserves where I help. Um, doing diagnostics and trying to see inside the body is very challenging. Okay? And elephants are prone to foot problems and there's very little that we can do in the situations we work with. You can take an x-ray but because they have highly fissured skin, so basically they're very wrinkly, you can't tell on an x-ray because everything's just compressed into one dimension. Is that little line on the skin, is a little bit of dirt caught in there, or is it actually a fracture and an infection in the bone? Because if you make the wrong course, call, this elephant's been crop raiding and you're moving it, and you release it and there's a problem deep inside the foot, that foot will fall apart over the next couple of months and you have an elephant with bones sticking out, rampaging through a village and killing people and then being shot and it's all a disaster. So getting the call right is important on a lot of reasons, but you know the ideal thing would be to take um, 
to take, put an elephant through a CT scanner. Now, logistically, you can't put an elephant through a CT scanner unless you chop its foot off and put it through. And even a mobile CT scanner, for argument's sake, you just can't get it to the places where it's needed. So, you know, CT is great, and you take all these slices, and people who are far more clever than me will tell you the computer does amazing things, and you can do it in 3D. There's a lot of radiation there, so it increases your cancer risk if you go for your yearly CT, so it's not advisable. But the other thing is, frustratingly, you often see in a hospital, busy surgeons are so strapped for time, they're just looking at the simple image, and you think, you do need a CT scan if you're just looking at the flat images and you're not using all the capabilities there. So how do we solve the elephant problem? And could it teach us something for what we want to do with human healthcare in places where CD, CT is not available or affordable? And so as a kid, I had this thing called the Viewmaster and I loved it. And you can see like the Jungle Book and the Eiffel Tower and you could see it in 3D and it was fantastic. And I thought, why can't we do this with x-rays? Okay, so CT scan is, is immensely clever and complicated, but surely something that just takes the flatness, the one dimensionality out of an x-ray. And instead of taking five or six different x-rays and trying to figure it out in your head, maybe your eyes can do it for you. And the simple solution is this little wooden block I've got a piece of Perspex there, but it can just be a wooden block. We put the x-ray plate in, a little portable machine, we take a picture, so the animal might be anaesthetized, or the elephant's got its foot on it in a zoo, or it's lying down after we've darted it, and then we can slide out the plate without moving anything, move that x-ray head 10, 20 centimeters like your eyes, take another x-ray and put it together. And what we get is a stereo radiograph, just like the viewfinder. Now this is why you have your 3D glasses, but, there is a caveat. You can't expect a lot from 20 pence's worth of technology, can you? And the reality is how I would use this in the field is you'd have a laptop and you, 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 know, you take the pick up there and you've darted the elephant and it's down, you take it to your x-rays, you put them together really quickly and you look at it. And the great thing is that I can change the distance of my head from the screen. Now you can't zoom through the auditorium closer and, and nearer to make it work perfectly for you. So it'll give you an idea of something. And depending on where you're sitting in the room, it may not work and it's all nonsense. But what I would say is, come and pester me at lunch. I'd love to show you the x-rays on the laptop and you can actually see how it works in the field. But this is really just to give you an idea. Now, I'll get them to put the lights down and I'll show you, before, before you put your glasses on, take them off, because I, I want you to see a few structures first. And then I want to see if you can differentiate them. And if it doesn't work, you can blame me, but it's quirky and they get embarrassing photos, so it's all good. So if you pop the lights down, and here we go. So this is a babarusa. It's a really crazy type of wild pig. It comes from Indonesia. And for some reason, evolution decided that the best thing to do with these big upper tusks was actually to push them through the nose. So they come out through the nose. Now you'll see there's some cracks over here, and you'll see there's some cracks over there. Now you can't tell which tusk they are, You'll also see this structure and this structure. Now you can't tell if they're on the surface of the skull or they're deep in the skull. There's the brain case, the sinuses, and you can have a look at that. And you'll see there's two rows of teeth. Now put on your glasses, and if you're lucky and you're in the sweet spot somewhere in the middle there and your eyesight is really good, hopefully it will work for you. And if it doesn't, I apologize, but come and pester me. Try, try and see, it's better than a flat x-ray even with the 20p of technology that I'm giving you. And this is priceless. I have to take out my camera and take a photo of all of you in the audience because this is the only way I'm ever going to ever get an embarrassing shot again. So that's it. And normally in real life, what I would do is I'd actually use it on white on a laptop screen. It works the best. It may not work as well for you. They, they've tested this and said, well, it's a bit crappy as you've probably seen, but it's sometimes it, for us, that's how we actually do it. And it takes me two minutes to do this on the computer, on the laptop. There's no fancy um, algorithms or anything involved with this. No AI, just do it by AI. And so for an elephant, if you do want to keep your glasses on, you'll see on a flat x-ray, we've got this little lesion there. Now, is this next to the bone and this foot's going to fall apart, or is it actually just a little superficial abscess in the bottom of an elephant sole? I can just clean it out, dig it out a bit, give some antibiotics, release it, it runs off, and it's not going to go and rampage through the villages later. And you will see then on the 3D x-ray, you can see this is far away from the bone. Is it wonderful? No. Does it do the job? Yes. How much does it cost? Less than 10 pounds. I mean, you can't argue with, uh, you know, it's, it's a couple of coffees at Starbucks. So the other bit before they hound me off the stage for taking too long and driving me mad with a load of craziness is ultrasound. Okay, so ultrasound's really amazing. It seems very simple. It was invented in Scotland after the war, um, and a, 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 you know a naval engineer and a gynaecologist got together and thought there was 
there was something there. And the first machines were the size of a room and they had a screen that's smaller than your, your, your phone and they had to immerse people in water baths. And now it's such an integral part of healthcare, we sort of take it for granted, and I do too. But it can cause us some problems. And I mean, it's really cheap. You can get these tiny scanners the size of this. They'll attach to your phone, they cost very little, you can buy the cheap ones on eBay, but there's a problem because it's not used in huge swathes of the world, not because of cost, but because of this, ultrasound gel. Now, you can't immerse everyone in a bath if you want to ultrasound scan them like they did in the old days. And if they just want to look at, you know, a water on your bum or they want to sell if you're pregnant, that's not practical. So we've had to find a way to put water into, as a medium, so the ultrasound can actually go, it doesn't like to go through air into the body. It's a big market, but bizarrely what it consists of is taking a bunch of petrochemicals, suspending them in a huge amount of water, putting it in a plastic container, and then flying it all over the planet. There's a handful of companies that do this. Does no one see a problem with this? So if you've got a humanitarian disaster in Haiti, there's not enough drinking water, but you're flying in a ton of ultrasound gel that is mainly water with all the carbon footprint and the costs, but you can't use the water? It just, so, I mean, the reason this, this, this happened for me is that I travel in crazy countries. If you're in Sierra Leone and Ethiopia and Myanmar and um, Saudi Arabia and China and you've got several passports and you're carrying weird electronic stuff and a bunch of weird substance in your bag, people think you're there to blow something up. So the number of times I've been detained, I can't use ultrasound gel in many places anymore because they think I'm a terrorist, okay? So, and there are other things that can spread infections. If you're dirty with a big vat, you get bacteria and, and fungi growing in there and then you're spreading it on someone pregnant's stomach, it's not good. So if you go into Democratic Republic of Congo, they've got really good doctors, very good. People will donate ultrasound machines, but they can't get this stuff. So people have had an attempt at finding better ways to do this and there's papers written on using olive oil. Now that's not a solution for Democratic Republic of Congo, is it? People have used cassava and cornstarch, but if you're scared and suspicious of wealth, Western healthcare, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna like that stuff spreading your belly and it's irritant and looks weird and it doesn't work that well. So, so why can't we do things a little bit better? So to fix my solution, I had to come up with something that's plants-based and I'm, I'm just gonna show you how it works so you can see how simple it is. So I've got a little bottle, it's empty. I have to get some water. They told me not to use one of your lovely glass bottles because knowing my clumsiness, surgeons are always clumsy by the way, um, I just smash it on the floor and then that I'd be even slower with getting my talk done. So what we'll do is we'll get some water, throw it in this cup. Well, I'll just leave it there for a second. And we'll just get some powder. If you thought the 3D glasses were weird, then this is even weirder. So it's basically just a, sc a scoop of a bunch of plant compounds there and I'm using a little bit more than I would normally use because we don't have 10 minutes to wait for it to work so I'm just going to stick it in there make a mess it's not my problem it's just like my children's <laughs> attitude to Lego is that I'll just put every single Lego block I own on the floor and then daddy will tidy it up for me so it's the same sort of thing what we'll do is we'll just put a bit of water in there I don't need a lot and unfortunately I can't twist this into a balloon and make a, a cheetah or something I did I did have to master that check check when I had small children, just put the lid on, give it a quick shake. Can you hear the difference? I have ultrasound gel now. And to show you that it's nothing nasty, without bringing my only one suit, I'll test it on myself, like all good crazy medical experimenters do. I'll make sure there's something here and there. My ultrasound machine is so old and primitive that they couldn't get it to connect to anything. So you'll just have to bear with this little camera that is pointing at it. Now I have to find all this tech. I like doing things and what we're just going to do is that's to tell them to, to, change, to change it to the ultrasound machine so you can see what's happening. I'll put a tissue there so I can actually see what I'm doing afterwards. We'll just take a bunch of this here. And where else to test something than to stick it on your eye? <laughs> so then you know that this can't be horrible, can you? Well, I need my eyes to operate. So and now, hopefully, if I unfreeze this, my machine has been trying to generate global. Wait, let's see if I've frozen the probe here. There's my eye. And it, for those of you who are skilled, you can actually see the back of the lens, and you can see part of the cornea. And if you wanted to be fancy, and I was actually skilled, we might be able to pick up a blood vessel, but I didn't say I'm a cardiologist. I'm married to one. She's clever. She knows how to make this damn machine work. Me being able to find a tumour in the line is sort of the limit of what I can do. But in, in essence, how come have we made something so simple, so horribly complicated? And so 
unfriendly to the planet and unfriendly to people, that we've got huge swathes of the human population that cannot get an ultrasound scan for pregnancy to tell if there's a problem simply because we don't have something to put in the water. It just, it does boggle the mind. And when, you know, when I work in places like this in Ethiopia, these poor ladies, their entire life consists of carrying water. That's their life. That's the majority of their time, is to carry water, not very clean water to drink. So we take it for granted that the water that we wash our cars with and we flush our toilet with is drinking water. It's not something that works in the rest of the planet. So this works with river water. I mean, it could work with urine if you really were desperate, but I wouldn't advise it. But it will work with most, most sources of water. So you can prioritise water that's there that's suitable for drinking and not need to waste it on doing that. So I guess... The whole point of this is really just to think about a big picture. We get so stuck in the technical details as innovators, entrepreneurs, vets, doctors, whatever it is that we have as a role to play. And we get so stuck on you know, the, the really cutting edge stuff that sometimes the lowest hanging, most meaningful fruit is right there and we just haven't questioned why we do it. You know, I work in places like this and we can go and I go and treat individual orangutans and I can do pretty amazing surgery and it's not due to my skills, it's due to all the people who help me. But does that save the planet? So, you know, the little things that I do with rather thinking about what I eat and what I buy and how I live my life actually probably save more orangutans than me rushing over there, training a bunch of vets, doing a bunch of ops, speaking to people, trying to make things work do. And I guess that's something we have to maybe think about in human healthcare as well. So, I mean, thank you for your patience with my crazy romp through my, a little facet of my life. I mean, my kids are amazingly patient to put up with me but it does seem innately unfair that they are going to get better health care than these children in India that I work with. And I think we do really need frugal innovation. Don't forget about it when there's all the fancy stuff to try and reduce our impact on the planet. When we don't have any more resources, consuming means consuming, and that's a finite resource the planet. But we can still get good health care out outcomes while actually making business sense of the whole thing. Anyway, you're all clever. If one of you want to steal the ideas and run with it, I'd be overjoyed. Come and speak to me if you want to see 3D um, x-rays or you know me slap some ultrasound on your eye. And then while Greg pretends to ask me some questions, it's all a pretense, so I tidy up my mess so I don't clutter up the whole stage for the next speaker. So thank you. <laughs>